This will be the summary for barrier islands. So what are barrier islands? They're elongate islands that parallel the coast, generally very long, but not very wide. They mostly occur on shallow trailing edge shelves like the Atlantic coast of North America. They're separated by inlets, and they're separated from the mainland by bays, lagoons, or marshes. How do barrier islands form? Well, the most accepted theory is called the submerge beach ridge theory. Sea level was much lower, about 85 meters lower, in the Pleistocene than today. During the Pleistocene, there were large glaciers, and because there were large glaciers in the continent, sea level was lower. Well, as the ice started to melt, sea level started to rise, and there were perhaps beach ridges along the shoreline, but as sea level rose, some of those beach ridges were drowned or became separated from the mainland by a lagoon. A rapid rise in sea level would leave that sand out in the ocean as a ridge, and that would become a barrier island. Then over time, as sea level continued to rise, the barrier island moved landward with the rising sea level. We'll talk about the process that allows that to occur in some of the following slides. These are the major environments on a barrier island. First, on the right, you have the shore face sediments. These are the beach sediments. You have ridges and the beach berm. Think of that as basically the beach. Then you get to the dunes, sand dunes. Sometimes, in many places, these sand dunes are cut by what are called overwash fans. You can see an example of one right there. The island may also contain forests or grassland, just depends on the type of island. The back part of the island consists of marsh, and then you may even have a tidal flat and then a lagoon. So those are, these are the major settings or depositional environments on a barrier island. Here's a picture of a beach in Louisiana. It's composed of sand, there's symmetrical ripples, and a group of students right here digging a trench on the beach. The dunes, generally cross-bedded sand, only flooded occasionally during large storms, sometimes a sandy soil. You have some plants that occur in the dunes, and those are actually very important plants um, because they stabilize the dunes. So you shouldn't be walking on those plants because it will destabilize them and destroy the dunes, and we don't want to destroy dunes. The salt marsh, the back part of the barrier island. Very mucky, organic rich sediment, sometimes very shallow water. You get a lot of crabs and oysters and things like that. Various types of grasses, cordgrass, sawgrass. You get mussels, some clams, birds. Okay, what are the major processes that shape barrier islands? And this is the real guts of what I want to talk about in terms of barrier islands. And there are four major processes. Longshore drift, inlet migration, the summer-winter change in the beach, and overwash fans. All of these are very important. So, before we talk about longshore drift, we need to talk a little bit about waves. So what are waves? A lot of students think they're movement of a current through the water. They're not. They're the movement of energy through the water, not a current of water. They're generated by wind. The size of waves are controlled by the strength of the wind, the fetch, the distance that the wind acts on the water. And there's a theory we have called the symmetrical oscillatory wave theory that explains how waves move and form. And there are various variables that are important in understanding waves. These include the celerity or the speed of the wave, the wave length, the wave height. You also have the period, which is the time for two crests to pass, one point. And you have the depth of the water. These are the important variables. Well, the symmetrical oscillatory wave theory, in this theory, the water particles oscillate in circular orbits, as this little diagram shows you. The water moves, but it follows circular orbits as the waves move. 
For deep water waves, orbital diameter decreases downward. For depths less than one half the wavelength, there's little disturbance of the bottom sediment. However, when the depth becomes very shallow, you get into what are called shallow water waves. And the waves, we say, start to feel the bottom. They start to disturb the sediment at the bottom. You get a decrease in the wavelength, decrease in the velocity of the wave. You get an increase in the wave height. And when you increase the wave height, eventually what's going to happen? The wave's going to break. The orbits change from circular to elliptical, but the period stays the same. So that's what a shallow wave may look like. You get more elliptical orbits. Well, longshore drift comes about after the waves break. So let's assume that the waves are coming into a beach at an angle, as this diagram shows you. You can see the arrows there. So the waves come in, they break, and they move up the beach. But then the water wants to go back. It's called the backwash. Is it going to follow the same path that it did for coming in? No. It's going to follow the steepest and shortest path, and that's going to be straight down the beach. So imagine one grain of sand or one particle of water. It comes in at an angle. It moves back straight down. Then it picked up by the next wave, moves down the beach. This produces what's called the longshore drift or the movement of sand along the beach. It's a very important process because it's very common on almost all beaches. To understand tidal inlet migration, which is another process that operates on barrier islands, we need to understand something about tides. What causes the tides? Well, it's the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. When the gravitational attraction of the moon and sun are combined, you get the spring tides, neap tides when they're opposed. The flood tide is when the tide comes in. The ebb tide is when it goes out. Here's a picture of what's called some herringbone cross stratification, where you see right there this pattern of flow in one direction and then flow in the opposite direction, bimodal fl flow during the ebb and flood. That's indicative of tides. That's from an ancient rock uh, about 300 million years old. Well, because of longshore drift, sand moves along barrier islands. Inlets form because tides have to come in and go out. Here's a picture of an inlet that formed after Isabel, which was a large storm on the North Carolina coast. Inlets also migrate. And they migrate because of longshore drift. As you can see in this diagram, the longshore drift is in one direction, and it adds sediment to one end of the inlet. Well, the tides still need to come in and out, so the tides want to maintain the size of that inlet. So what do they do? They erode on the downstream side of the inlet. So the inlet actually migrates because of the longshore drift. A third process that operates on Barrier Island is the summer-winter change that occurs in the beach. During the winter, there's more wave energy, and the beaches are smaller, and the sand is stored offshore in sandbars. But during the summer, there's less wave energy and more regular wave energy, and sand is added to the beaches, and the beaches are wider. What happens is that sandbars migrate onto the beach and make the beach wider. So that's the change between summer and winter. The fourth process is a very important one. It's called overwash fans. And you can see some overwash fans here in that top photograph. You see those fan-shaped bodies that extend from the beach to the back part of the barrier island. And in the diagram below, you can see a schematic diagram of what one of these overwash fans looks like. These, as I said, are a very important process. They occur during storms. And what happens is that sand is moved from the beach to the back part of the barrier island. And you deposit the sand as a tongue or a fan of sand. The reason these are important is that they move islands landward. As sea level rises, that causes the islands to move landward. This is a cross-section 
of a barrier island, we call it a transgressive barrier island, because it's migrating landward. You can see here the beach, the dunes, and then the lagoon and marsh. And notice that the beach part and the dunes part are migrating over the grassland and the marsh. You can sort of think of it like a tank tread, is that the sand is keep being pushed from the beach to the back part of the barrier island and move the whole island landward.